Mr. Sawicki, welcome to Biotech Health X. How are you today? I'm great. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Our pleasure. Yeah, we are so excited to be talking to you and to Cryoport as a global leader in supply chain solutions for cell and gene therapies. So I want to start with, could you explain Cryoport's mission and its role in the life sciences industry? Sure. Uh, So Cryoport uh, itself is focused around delivering premier solutions for supply chain, uh, cold chain management of cell and gene products, as well as other biopharmaceutical products that are high value uh, and are irreplaceable. And can you explain a little bit about how you in this industry, you're working alongside being able to enable manufacturers, contract manufacturers, contract research organizations, developers, and researchers to carry out their respective businesses with certainty in the life sciences industry. Yeah, so in order to do that, we got to take a little bit of a step back. I think it's important to understand the paradigm and in, in the way that we support the paradigm, right? So cell and gene therapy, as well as some of these other critical materials that are now coming out in the space are, are in most cases, one of a kind, irreplaceable material. And you know we've really built our company to support what we call high value, low volume products. Uh, so in essence, you know products that, that you cannot fail on. Um, most historical pharmaceutical development has an acceptable scrap rate or loss rate. And if you look at any of the publications out there, on average, you see scrap rates or temperature deviations anywhere from you know, 10 to 25 percent, which means that 10 to 25 percent of the products that are being shipped around the world have a adverse event uh, that, that deviates from their approved storage or distribution parameters. If you do that in the cell and gene space or, or, or most of the products that we support, they're, they're rendered unusable. And you know, in most cases, these are therapies that range from you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars to three and a half million dollars per product are patient specific. So if we have a failure event that would occur, you're killing the patient. And so we built the entire company around supporting what we call zero defect uh, or or not having a zero percent acceptable loss rate. Okay, if that makes sense. And I want to kind of dive a little bit more into some of the key technological innovations that Cryoport has developed in temperature controlled logistics. Yeah, so we, it, it, if you take a look at the industry, there is, a, there is an ISO classification called 21973 that really dictates the handling and distribution of, of cell and gene based materials or any irreplaceable materials. We have largely built that paradigm. We wrote most of that for the ISO body, uh, and and it was actually being written under what's called the standard coordinating body at the time. And in essence, what that does is it defines the parameters of use for the equipment used to store and distribute those types of therapies. So some of the innovations that have come out of that that we've pioneered are the requalification of the equipment. Uh, really um, being able to track the performance of the equipment down to hours. So we know within a couple of hours how long that particular unit is going to last in the field. Our systems will actually track changes based on the way that that product is handled in the field, the way that the packaging is oriented, for example, and we're able to to ascertain the impact of that handling on the hold time of, of the equipment that's being used to distribute. Um, you know, that the only one in the industry that has validated cleaning methodology. So we go through and we do a, a validated cleaning process similar to what you would see in an ER, uh, in an emergency room uh, from a sterilization standpoint so that we're preventing any contamination from being brought into a clinical setting, for example. Those are just some examples of the things that we've pioneered. Talk about the importance of that on in the industry and just how impactful those can be. Well, I'll I'll give you an anecdotal example. So one of our commercial clients that we've been supporting since 2017, recently we sat down in a strategic business review where we review the statistics, we review the performance characteristics, and they told us that we have outperformed every other vendor in the space by three orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Um, That that for me is is very telling uh, as to the impact of what we've done within that space. We've enabled them with a degree of certainty to be able to distribute their products, which are patient specific, irreplaceable, without a fear of, of having patient loss, uh, which is obviously a loss of a patient, but also loss of revenue for them 
um, where they can't replace it. You can't just, you know, pull another another unit out of the freezer and send it off because it is specifically designed and built for that particular individual. Yeah, that's it's huge. It's very impactful. We thanks for so. sharing that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So you have a presence in over 50 strategic locations worldwide. So how do these locations enhance your service offerings and how have you been able to scale successfully at such a size? Yeah, you know, timing is extremely important for some of these products. Uh, we have a number of products that are on the market where, you know, even a 24 hour time frame and bringing, being able to move that product into a dosing situation has an impact on patient outcome. And the only way to realistically be able to support that type of turnaround time is to have an appropriate density of facilities in different geographies that allow us to be able to move product quickly uh, be able to, to respond in some cases as, as little as, as minutes instead of days to, to be able to position and, and get product out the door to move it to our physical location so that we can ensure that the patients are being dosed uh, efficiently. So um, we also have to address customs and, and regulatory issues and you know being able to position equipment and material in different geographies so we we can eliminate or minimize the impact of things like customs and and uh, and and such is is extremely uh, important. That's why we built the density of facilities that we have. Okay, that's very critical to have that and to be able to to respond in minutes, like you said. In some instances, it is. I mean, there's some yeah. products that are out there that the shelf. It's it's not necessarily the shelf life. It's the patient cycle, and if they don't dose within a set time frame after the onset of a given adverse event, mm -hmm. uh, the the efficacy of that product goes down very quickly. Okay. How does Cryoport then collaborate with clients like biopharmaceutical companies and research institutions to meet their logistics needs? So we have a very uh, strong engineering and consulting division that will sit down as they're planning out their clinical trials and or their commercial launch strategy. We will work hand in hand with them on, on packaging design, distribution strategy, uh, you know, geographic distribution needs, uh, it, all specific around the modeling of their need base. And, and this really helps them get a fundamental understanding of what they need to do. And, and we work very closely with them almost as a partner, as an extension of their entity versus as a traditional third-party vendor. And, and many of them actually use us in that in that function where they don't have to build out their own infrastructure from an engineering and, and, um, and validation related uh, consideration, they'll, they'll just use our assets. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about success stories. Now, you shared a story just a few minutes ago about somebody that, you know, it was very impactful about, uh, you know, that specific story. But could you share another uh, success story or two where cryoport services played a critical role in clinical trials or commercial therapies? Well, I'll give you a cited, another cited example. We worked hand in hand with Sarepta and their product development team in designing a new uh negative ADC or dry ice shipper for the market that is custom built for gene therapy. And it has been used to launch their Duchenne muscular dystrophy drug, which was approved last year. And so, um, you know, that, that product, that particular packaging configuration, we worked hand in hand with their teams over a two year period prior to launch uh, to build a custom bespoke a uh, piece of packaging that eliminates the liabilities associated with dry ice distribution today. So simple things that you would think of, but but didn't exist are, you know, you can reload, you know, you can re-ice what they call a re-ice a dry ice shipper without actually accessing the commodity. Well, when you have a three and a half million dollar commodity, you don't want somebody to be able to go in and tamper with it, right? So they have the ability to open the package without actually accessing the commodity itself and be able to re-ice it to extend the hold time. Uh, that's one example of an innovation in a, in a packaging configuration that that uh, was built in conjunction with with the team. Um, you know, we're the ones who pioneer uh, real time track and trace in the in the space and being able to see where your packages are at all times in the pharmaceutical side of things. Um, you would think it'd be relatively straightforward, but with all the regulations and requirements associated with FDA and others, it, it's it's been something they have a tendency to move very slow on. So we pushed that, you know, honestly, close to 10 years ago now and and, and really have pioneered that, um, you know, all the requalification, the ISO 21973 standards that we already talked about. We wrote most of those standards in conjunction with the standards coordinating body for the ISO body that now uses it. 
from a recommendation standpoint in the FDA. You know, I'm glad that you brought up the regulations point because I want to talk about some of the challenges that you face. Uh, Let's talk about a few of those challenges, but also how does the company then navigate some of these complexities? Well, it's planning, right? I mean, as much planning as you can get, and you never have enough time to plan. And, and one of the challenges we have with cell and gene therapies is their their product development life cycle is five to seven years, not 15 years as a simple you would see in a traditional pharmaceutical product. So where if you're looking at a small molecule at a historical biologic, they have three to four years to, to plan the supply chain considerations during that launch process. For cell and gene, in many instances, you have less than six months. So, you know, um, that's a significant complexity that we've had to deal with. The second issue is is all of the um, historical pharmaceutical distribution modalities through the big guys like Amerisource Bergen and Cardinal Health and McKesson and others, their paradigm was built on a very high volume consideration and um, didn't take into account the specialized handling needs for fulfillment and, and distribution requirements for cell and gene. And so we've had to work hand in hand with our, our partners to deal with those types of issues. Another example would be secondary labeling, right? So when you, when you have a product that is an off the shelf product, like an allergenic product for cell and gene therapy, you can't just go in and relabel a package that's stored in cryogenic conditions. The labels don't stick. You know, it's you know, you ever try sticking something to an ice cube, right? It's right. it's not very very straightforward. Not gonna happen. Yeah. So developing novel methodologies to be able to do things like secondary labeling a pharmaceutical product that's on the allergenic space is are things that we've had to work hand in hand with them on from a developmental standpoint. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, let's talk about the future now. What are some of the next steps for expanding cryoport services and market presence in the coming years? So one of the areas that we're heavily focused on right now is moving upstream, right? So we've been really focused around product handling, you know, all the storage, fulfillment, labeling, kitting, distribution requirements. Uh, one of the next challenges that this space is going to have is procurement of the starting material, right? So the the what's called an apheresis or leukophoresis product. Uh, so basically, the patient goes in, they get their blood drawn, it gets processed in a certain way, but they're relying on a very limited number of centers in, in capacity to be able to do that. And if you listen to any of the earnings calls for most of the major commercial players in the cell engine space, their challenge is patient accessibility. And so what we're doing is we're building out through what we call our IntegraCell platform, a standardized cryo collection and cryopreservation platform, collection through partners. And so we're, we, we have partnerships in, with folks like the um, uh, National Marrow Donor Program, as well as other uh, clinic networks uh, that are doing historical blood collection and, um, and teaming them up with our standardized cryopreservation service platform so that we can process uh, material in a very highly standardized manner, improve the quality of the inbound material that's going into manufacturing and improves patient accessibility. And so we're really driving that platform. Our first facilities are gonna be launching one late this quarter, one in next quarter in Houston, Texas and Liege, Belgium. And those will continue to build out and they'll be able to start to support the upstream needs from a, from a cell and gene standpoint. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today and walking us through this process. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime.